Good morning, every day, and happy World AIDS Day. A uh, very exciting World AIDS Day today. And this particular talk, when I first put it together, I was actually, we were commissioned by the Family uh, Practitioners Congress in September of this year to come and present on the new advanced HIV guidelines. So uh, this is actually the presentation that I thought would bring to East London for World AIDS Day today. Um, and it had two sections. The first section is like a really big overview of advanced HIV disease, done in 40 minutes. And then the second part was looking specifically, because we're going to discuss a patient, the ARV management of that patient that was done by a colleague of mine, Dr. Mendelssohn. But very exciting, the National Department of Health today is launching an update on the HIV guidelines, probably the most radical changes to ARV care since HART was introduced. Da, 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 da. And so I will be covering those as well at the end of the presentation. So I've brought a few slides. They've brought it out as like a presentation that's already been rolled out this week in preparation for, for today. And there'll be an official announcement today. So very, very, very hot off the press. Um, and so I'm actually going to also record this um, in two different sections so we can make that little section available just to update people on what will be happening from now on. So that's all very exciting. But we're going to start off talking about the HIV Clinician Society's clinical guidelines that came out this year on advanced HIV disease. And in a way, the fact that we need a guideline on advanced HIV disease is quite depressing. Because ideally, if you just, you know, if you diagnose people early with HIV and you put them on all the treatment, we should expect none of them to ever have advanced HIV disease. As a matter of fact, you have a 100% success rate if you put people on ARVs with HIV. Um, and the fact that we've had to bring out a guideline tells us a lot, you know, as people, we all are our own worst enemies. Um, and most of the patients we see with advanced HIV disease, it's either patients who got diagnosed very late, but actually it's very few of those. Most of the patients we are seeing have had some ARV exposure in the past, has defaulted on their treatment, and now they're coming really sick. Um, and what's lovely about this guideline, what they did is they um, commissioned infectious disease experts in South Africa to each write a chapter. So, for example, Dr. Dave Stick from Freer wrote the chapter on gastroenteritis. So it's very nice. It's by local experts, very South African relevant and very much considering also our public sector setting. So we're going to use a patient to help find our way through these guidelines. And we're going to call him Mr. J. He's 27 year old. He gets brought in by the family. You know, you get those patients. They don't want to go to the hospital. They want to go to the hospital. And then they get so sick that they can't resist. So the patient just loads them in the car. Um, and there's 48 kilograms, they wheel him in on a, on a wheelchair, and he's weak, he's got a dry cough, but no night sweats, maybe some fevers, it's very non-specific, he does have some intermittent diarrhea, he's struggling to eat, um, he's very apathetic in the consultation, the family does all the talking and explaining, um, and when you take a little previous history, he did have some aerobics before in Cape Town, it was once a day, a tablet once a day in 2018, but he's been defaulting treatment since 2019. And when you look on the NHLS, you find the CD4 that was done by the clinic four months ago, um, which was 42 cells. So this is a very typical presentation that we see in our OPDs and in our practices. And it's all very non-specific. And there's a few challenges with these kinds of patients with advanced HIV disease. The first problem is, is that you can see the guy's sick. But because they're not making any inflammation, it's very hard to figure out what exactly is making me very sick at the moment. Is it a diarrheal disease? Is it lung disease? Is it HIV wasting disease? What's going on? Our test doesn't work as well. So you do the gene expert, but the gene expert comes back negative. Your x-rays are not very helpful or useful. So because we don't make inflammation, also we can't seem to, to easily put our finger on what's going on. And more importantly, we know this, but we forget this. Almost all of these patients will have one more than one significant diagnosis. And what tends to happen because we're all so busy, is usually you find TB. You go, oh, he's got TB. You put them on TB treatment and then you send them home. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, they come in for the death certificate. And the challenge is a lot of these patients has got more than one thing going on. And so actually what you need to do is Sorry. just approach it. Yes, thank you. Sorry, we just had an interruption from somebody just checking on us. So we just told them that we are fine. Um, but our poor patients are not so fine. And one of the big worries is, is that while we're busy investigating, trying to find out all the stuff that's going on with them, a lot of them pass away. 
So they literally come in on death's door and you're sort of sending off LPs and sending off various tests and somewhere along the line they pass away. And they did actually a sort of pre-ARV -A -pre era, they did a, a a study in Johannesburg where they're doing autopsies on all the patients who died of AIDS. And most of them have one diagnosis, you know, like TB or PCP on the death certificate. And they found that the vast majority of them, 80% of them, had at least two or other three major diagnoses, like a sarcoma somewhere, or CMV or whatever. So there's, um, and that, that yeah, makes it very difficult to untangle it all. So also, this is very from the old days, so the old and the new. Um, in the old days of HIV, we all had these charts on our walls in terms of the different CD4 counts and what kind of illnesses you're going to, to expect. And we're going to use a little bit of that to create a mental diagnostic map when we look at these patients. Because the CD4 tells you what's on the menu. What can I expect? What can I um, happily exclude? And usually the easy, there's a few things we go for first. And we normally go for these first because they're easy to diagnose. So there's some things that are easy to pick up. If they get DNA but comes back positive bonus, you've diagnosed your TB. Hepatitis A and B is very easy to test for. You can do a CT scan if they've got any space occupying lesions. Um, and if you, you know, sometimes you're lucky, the X-ray shows you a nice classic pneumonia. They've got a nice obvious skin confection or composes on their legs. There might be a proper nice lymphoma you can biopsy. So these things are relatively easy to diagnose, and that's usually where, where we go first. What's a bit more tricky is once that CD4 count drops. So once the CD4 is under 200, you now have normal stuff that presents <coughs> immediately, but you also have some weird and wonderful. So extra pulmonary TB, the ones in red is all the stuff we're actually gonna talk about today, in my very fast overview. Um, but extra pulmonary TB disease is always an issue. And you get some very atypical bacterial infections that just doesn't look like the normal infections. And we're going to talk a bit about chronic diarrhea today. And then you get those weird fungal infections, which none of us, those of us who went to medical school in the 80s didn't even learn about these. They only came later as HIV disease came in. And now we're quite familiar with things like cryptococcus, which people in Europe have never heard of. But once the CD4 goes under 75, you really get strange and wonderful things. And I think for us, you are going to struggle to diagnose most of those. Most of us have not got a, you know, immediate, oh, that's a histoplasmosis or that's an aspergillosis. CMV uh, colitis, particularly hard to diagnose because you're going to need a biopsy for that. Your max tricky because they all look like TB. So these are, are complicated and it's useful to know about them that if your patient's not responding or you're not finding a diagnosis, get them to somebody who can find these particular things. So it's a little bit, we sometimes get too comfortable with just treating the cryptococcal meningitis or the TB and they're not responding and hold on, actually something else might be going on. And then of course, to make it even more complicated when your patient is losing weight is all of your possible malignancies. So our normal malignancies like cervical cancer and even your colon, lung, breast cancers are more common in our advanced HIV disease patients. But we also have specific cancers like a posy, common in our, um, and very important, 15% of them have got no skin lesions. So they might have composure of the gut and they'll look really, really sick and you're gonna really, really struggle to, to, to figure that out. And then lymphoma is much, much more common, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in our HIV patients. So when you've got a large mass, maybe it's not, not just TB. So we created actually um, an approach to advanced HIV disease 15 years ago, uh, when I was very much involved in training doctors for the HIV diploma, uh, we were working with Bits RHI that used to run that 10 day course for the diploma. So we tried to create an approach of district hospital level approach of how do you work a patient up with advanced HIV disease. And that's basically what we're going to run through today. And I'm not going to go into all the stuff you know, I'm hoping to pick up the odd bits, tips that's interesting. When you start off, the important thing is to always make sure, obviously, that your patient um, does not have a severe sickness going on. So if your patient is very sick, confused, tachyneic, hypertensive, or in the or curve 65 here, not relevant, you can just put AHD in there. Get them onto antibiotics, you can admit those patients, you can stabilize them first. And then after you've stabilized them, you're going to start working through specific systems systematically. We've created this sort of level of investigations based on what's very common and what's very dangerous. So your pulmonary is by far the system that gets affected first, both with your TB and your pneumonias, 
And then you're going to look for extra cognitive, neurological, abdominal, other systems. And that's what we're going to quickly work through, work through today. So respiratory system, um, we all know about looking for gene expert. Um, and in the clinic setting, we try not to do the gene expert and the x-ray on the same day. Save a little bit of money. So in the gene expert, if the gene expert is positive and there's no clear other lung things you want to exclude, like an infusion, you don't need to do an x-ray. Save us a bit of time and effort. Um, but of course, if your gene expert is not helpful or patient's very dry cough and can't give you a sputum, then you're going to do your, your x-ray. If the cough is very productive in your advanced HIV disease, it's worthwhile to also send a good old fashioned MTMX. Because quite often they might have a pneumonia, but they don't have the typical normal bacteria. So there might be a staph going on or pseudomonas on top of everything. And then a simple principle, I think you're all aware of this, for pleural effusion and ascites, any patient with HIV that has a pleural effusion or has ascites are assumed to have TB. It doesn't matter what's gonna come back on your fluid results. So remember an advanced HIV disease, the patient is not having inflammation. They might not even have an exudate. They might not even be very high protein. You might not even actually find the bacilli. So if there's a pure effusion ascites, patient's HIV positive, you're going to start that patient on TB, on TB treatment. But do still send all your things, especially for gene expert and TB culture. But quite often what happens is our patients come in and they are classic TB symptoms. You know that the patient we described earlier, but they're also quite short of breath. Um, and the things we need to always keep in mind, especially if the SATs are a little bit low, is that TB in itself is not going to give you low SATs. And it's not going to make you that short of breath early in disease. You know, your, your lungs are going to be pretty destroyed by the time TB starts making you very tachypneic. And of course, in today's section, COVID is an obvious thing to, to double check for, but it's just to have a couple of words again on PCP. So we actually see much less PCP than we used to because a lot of our patients at least are on Bactrim. Um, and sometimes we're so focused on the TB and the pneumonias. Um, and PCP we see in all of our low CD4 counts. So CD4 is less than 250, but also in anybody's got existing lung disease. That's why we give everybody with TB Bactrim. So just having TB, it's going to make it more likely for you to get to get a pneumocystis sterobetchy pneumonia, but we still call it PCP. Just to be interesting. Um, and a lot of our patients has not necessarily been taking Bactrim. The Bactrim is very good at preventing this. And normally what you see is you've got the patient, they're quite short of breath. Um, sats are not great, but when you listen, it doesn't sound that bad. You know, they look like a really bad asthma attack, but Actually, that's not too bad. When you do the x-ray, that's actually quite a good PCP x-ray. It's not very convincing of why they are so severely ill if you look at the x-ray picture. And that's usually the way we make the diagnosis. So certainly in public sector, we don't have any um, other investigations we can do. And so we do a clinical diagnosis. And quite often, we will have patients who've got TB, and they're very short of breath, and we'll put them on TB treatment, and we'll treat them with bacteria. Now I've got lots of patients I've treated with Bactrim over the years where well, I don't even know if they've had PCP. Um, but you have to have a high index of suspicion. So we're going to continue with our patient. <clears throat> and he's had his gene expert done at the clinic. We've already got the result here today. And that result is negative. And you do an x-ray. And it's very non-specific mild hydro lymphadenopathy. You know those x-rays where it doesn't really convince you of anything. Something's going on, but I'm not sure. So to the crowd. Treatment today. So it's coming today. Those were the symptoms. Burden's got a non-specific x-ray. Anybody start to be treatment today? Probably, we would probably not start today. But it might you still have TB? Definitely. Okay. So the worry is, is that we now need to look. What are we going to do next? So anybody, what is our district hospital settings? What is our next bedside investigation we can do for this guy? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yay, TB lab. We all love TB lab. Do you all know the criteria? Yes, yeah, so we'll, well, the gene expert, if we didn't have the gene expert today, you would do the TB exam as a bedside test. Quite right. In this patient, we have the gene expert results. So that's why we did the TB lab. It would be very good. It's a bedside investigation. 
genetics. So why you say look for gene expert if you do your TV lab? Does anybody know the criteria for when we do lab? Thank you very much. So it's changed. So there is an actual guideline. Um, so we're going now to look at extrapulmonary TV. And in that guideline, they have made the criteria less stringent. So the problem with TV is when they're positive, they're very helpful. When they're negative, they're completely useless. Okay, so they don't exclude TV. Um, and so in the old days, we know that you've got a better yield if they're very advanced HIV disease. So if they HIV positive and they've got low CD4 counts. But they've actually made it a bit more lenient. So what's interesting about this is for outbound, um, you have to obviously be HIV positive, you need to have signs and symptoms of TB and 100, it used to be under. Or if they've got advanced patients who are HIV positive, um, irrespective of whether you uh, you can do a TV lamb on it. So that made that investigation that you can for patients a bit healer. It's the guy TV lamb for that an active TV. You can actually Google it. Uh, that and it's called the TV screening and testing standard operating procedure. You should be able to find that on as well oh, that literally came out in the law um, and even a gesture for example to start people on treatment. Lambs to do some blood enough money to do four tests. And that one, if you could choose four tests to do on the blood test, some blood, your department is out of money in a natural test. Thank you. And just remember, we don't. Because it's quite often very non specific in our HIV patients and for pain. Excellent, well done. So, TB definitely affects bone marrow. You get these chronic disease bone marrow suppressions. So, quite often they're anemic. So, definitely the ABHP, we're going to do us. It's very, very, that's very helpful. If it's normal, it doesn't exclude TV, but it makes it much less. And there's therapy a seven. You're not going to be chasing that TV. I'll just have easy access ultrasound, for example. We are wondering. So it squeezes the granuloma on top of the liver and grows. Sorry, everybody, that I lost you there for a minute. I am aware. I'm just going to get back into the presentation. There we go. Um, so as I was saying, your ALP and your gamma GT can give you a clue whether there might be some disseminated TB, but none of this confirms TB. So ideally, if you were in that district hospital setting even, um, you might want to do an ultrasound next. And we are currently on a big mission at the Family Medicine Department at CMH. We've got a very passionate uh, registrar who's very keen on ultrasound. 
is actually doing his master's from trying to identify what skills every intern should be able to have on ultrasound. And we would like to train them up during their internship on how to use a normal ultrasound line around the hospital, but at least check for some basic things and, and, and TV of the abdomen is certainly helpful. If there's any gland, obviously put a needle in it. And I don't know, some of you might not be aware of the Middlebrook TV culture medium. We have them at the NHLS. So you ask for those little bottles. And after you've done your FNA, you rinse your needle in that little bottle and you can set that for TB culture. So that's very useful also to be able to see if there is live bacilli and eventually test for resistance. It's a bit like an insurance policy for the future. And any patient who's got also, so maybe they've got a classic TB picture and your gene expert is positive, but your patient has also got a bit of confusion or a bit of headache, uh, some vague sort of neurological stuff going on, then please also do an LP. Because if your patient has got TB meningitis, it's going to change how long, for example, you're going to give your regimen. So you need to have a high suspicion of that. So we get back to our patient and we've got his bloods back. It's Thursday now. His HB is 7.5. His CRP is 35. And you can see his ALP and his gamma GT are both up. The ALT is often a little bit increased. It's under 120, you sort of ignore it. Um, but you can see the ALP and the gamma GT is, is, is more increased than the ALT. Um, and ideally, we would now do an ultrasound setting at CMH. That would be our next step usually. But now you're out in um, Butterworth or the Siki Siki. You don't have access to ultrasound. There's no glands to FNA. Would you start TB treatment today on this patient? Yeah, so I think by this point, we want to start empiric TB treatment. And I think the challenge with TB treatment is either too quickly dismissing the TB because the gene expert was negative, or we keep on investigating, trying to find something and delay too long to put them on treatment. So we start him on some rifafor and try and find some specimen you can send for a culture. So this guy, we've run out of options. There was no fluid culture. Um, there was no um, um, uh, glands to, to, to put a needle into. So this is a trick from, from Dave said, um, is to actually send the early morning urine for TB culture. It doesn't have a great yield, but in disseminated TB is similar to the TB lab. We're assuming that the kind of people who might have TB lambs positive might even have a culture. And certainly if they got a urinary TB lamb positive, it's worthwhile to send a culture, again, as an insurance policy. Because you're starting with special <coughs> treatment and we don't know if there might be resistance underlying or what else might be going on. So we've made a provisional empirical diagnosis of TB. Can we relax, relax with this guy, bring him back in two weeks? No, I've already primed you on that. There might be other stuff going on. So the next system we need to look at is the neurological system because this is the most dangerous. This is the kind of thing that's going to kill your patient while you're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and this has now changed. We used to have a reflex testing for a CD4 under 100. They now should be doing CRADs. I'm not sure if all the labs are on board, but some of them are. Where the CD4 is under 200, they now do a reflex crab. Our highest yields for positive crags is still much more CD4 under 100. Very occasional that you're going to get a cryptococcotinemia, as they call it, of a CD4 between 100 and 200, but they might be the odd one. So they've actually enlarged that, that window. Um, and in a, on an LP level, for a neurological assessment, if you get a trace gene expert, on, on, on CSF, that's significant, that's TV, end of story. And of course, um, ideally, in certain scenarios, you want to CT scan before LP. So again, we don't have easy access to CTs in the districts. So we actually have to be not find excuses not to do LPs. But there's very specific scenarios in which you won't do LPs, and isolated cranial nerve palsy is not one of them. But obviously, if your patient has got a very low GCS, if they've got actual papilledema, you can see they've got a new focal neurological deficit, or if they've got a first seizure, this is sometimes still a little bit of a worry. So if you've got a patient, HIV patient with advanced HIV disease who's had a seizure, you need to see to them before you're gonna LP them. You'll have to get them to a big center to do that. Um, and then if they do obviously have a history of something like a shunt. So this is actually out of the advanced HIV disease guideline um, where they define meningitis as, or what, what will make you go the meningitis route is if you've got any two of the following, fever, headache, neck stiffness, or confusion. 
a bit like your TV, TV questions. There are specific questions you're going to look for that's going to make you suspicious. And this I found interesting because we don't always think like that about meningitis. They differentiate between acute meningitis. So these are patients who get very sick very quickly and usually will present within seven days of being um, sick. And then you get those subacute, what they call subacute or chronic meningitis. And these are organisms where you sort of slowly get sicker over a longer period of time and the patient tends to present later. And they're actually very different than the organisms that cause them. Acute meningitis, I don't want to cover because this we're actually quite comfortable with. Um, this is usually people who come in very, very sick. They've got a nice classic back stiffness and massive fever. And you, know, you can see meningitis um, just by the way they try climb on the couch. Um, and you obviously want to get your albies and blood cultures off and you want to start them on your, your IV antibiotics. They speak specifically about covering for the seria and immune compromised patients, which is not HIV. So they're talking about older patients over 50 years, this new opinion, um, but also patients who might have cancer or might be on immunosuppressive drugs um, or alcoholics, and then you might cover with ampicillin as well. But let's not pause there. Um, and let's look a little bit just at chronic or subacute meningitis. And these are the ones that we often see. So we classically look for TBM or cryptococcal meningitis. Um, and these lovely tables are in the guideline. So what I'm hoping I'm going to inspire you today is going to look at the guideline. But also the other ones that we don't always think about and we don't test for is your herpes simplex viruses, your varicella zoster, and your CMVs. And there might be more of those than you think because it's not something you routinely ask for on an LP. So what do you want to request now when you are doing that LP? And probably the biggest thing we're trying to emphasize with our interns as well is if you're going to do an LP, do an opening question. On private, you guys probably all have manometers. We don't have manometers where I work, um, but we use a drip, drip ID set. You're all familiar with being able to use the drip giving set to measure pressures, to make sure your pressure's lying on the side. And you measure the actual column of how far your CSF pushes up, and you add another six centimeters. Very simple. But if you've got a patient where we're suspecting cryptococcal meningitis, especially if it's an iris, and you're taking your, um, you do your pressure and your pressure's up, that's probably cryptococcal meningitis. And you won't wait for your output results before you start your procedures. So you're gonna actually start treatment while you wait, because quite often they, they do very badly if you don't start treatment earlier. We're obviously going to do our protein. Um, if it's lower, more TBM. If it's higher, more bacterial. These are all very sort of um, guidances rather than rules. Um, and what's interesting with TBM, for example, is that a certain quite a big 10, 15% of patients um, might have completely normal CSF early in disease. So you have a guy where he's got TB, he's a little bit confused. You do the LP, and the LP is essentially normal. Gram stains and obviously your bacterial culture. We do do cell counts. They're not always very useful, certainly not to exclude anything, um, but they are useful when you have obviously polymorphs, for example. You're obviously going to ask for your CRAG um, and your syphilis, and then always, always just send enough fluid for gene expert and TB culture. It's actually very difficult to take too much CSF. You can take a considerable amount of fluid. Um, but for your TB culture, especially, you want that in your back pocket in case. There is a gene expert that's positive. Um, and in the gene expert, the more fluid you have in your little bottle for gene expert, the more likely you're going to yield a result. So it's worthwhile to fill those up if possible. So this is interesting. I'm not sure about the NHLS options, but that's certainly an option in private, is that you store up to 10 mil, five or 10 mils, depending on how much you can tap out of your poor patient, for a possible viral PCR. So we don't want to do those viral panels on every single patient. It's going to get a little bit expensive. But it's nice to have that if you've got your patient, CSF is very non-specific, the protein is high, you sort of guess what you think it is and start them on treatment and they're not responding, they're not getting better, they're getting worse. And then you might want to start looking for more of the weird and wonderfuls. Um, and they, they, gave, they give specific recommendations on some empiric treatments you might decide to add. So maybe you've got a patient who definitely looks like meningitis. The gene expert is negative though. You might decide to just treat for TBM anyway, um, but sometimes you can just cover for herpes simplex. So you don't necessarily have to go and test for it. It's cheap and doesn't do much harm. And the same, you can also cover for urosyphilis if 
you're concerned waiting for the results again doesn't do too much hard that's sort of a little bit covering all our basis approach which we don't generally do but these are our advanced patients and then again if you're concerned about your immunocompromised elderly patients over 50 then you can cover with some ampicillin or hysteria right so remember he was very apathetic in that interview everybody else was talking for him and you don't know if he's just very sick or if he's actually slightly confused sometimes very difficult to tell and so we decided to um yeah we mentioned that you want to obviously make sure it's not tbm and so we did do a lumbar puncture on this day which was normal so it doesn't completely exclude tbm but uh, it's probably just because he's very sick that he's so apathetic but this was not his only complaints. Um, we're obviously going to screen his kidneys because it's very sick. I'm not going to cover renal here. That's a whole thing in its own. Um, but you obviously want to, if your creatins are abnormal, you want to figure out is it an acute kidney injury because my patient is dehydrated and a bit septic, or is it a chronic kidney disease such as high van? What I want to chat a bit about is diarrhea. So about 40 to 80% of our people with infected with HIV, not yet on art, is going to have diarrhea at some point. Um, and it's almost always there in your advanced HIV disease. Either they have diarrhea at the moment or they've had diarrhea on and off. It's one of those things that's very much part of the history. What is concerning is that quite often that's the reason why they get admitted. So because of the diarrhea, maybe even the nausea and vomiting, they get dehydrated and now they end up in hospital. Um, and they've found that it's actually associated with significant mortality because of hyperkalemias or dehydration that's not being properly managed. So the definition in this chapter, written by Dr. Daystead, um, we use a definition of acute less than two weeks and chronic diarrhea more than two weeks. So that means is that if it's less than two weeks, we can still reassure and give advice and diet and things and not give the pyramid. Um, but once it's over two weeks, we need to investigate to figure out what's going on. So now I'm going to show you a really cool bit out of the guidelines. Those of you who are into infectious diseases might be aware of this. But one of the ways that you can approach diarrhea in these advanced HIV diseases, because there's so many possible organizing organisms that can cause this, is trying to identify if this is a small bowel diarrhea or a large bowel, bowel diarrhea. So for small bowel diarrhea, that's usually those large volume watery stools. They're literally just water pouring through them. That's actually the more common presentation that we see. It's quite bland in nature, and they more often might actually be having some nausea and vomiting. With your large bowel diarrhea is those low volume frequent stools, a uh, bit of tenesmus, and you might even have some mucus and red blood cells involved there. And when you examine them, uh, the small bowel diarrhea are more often um, pyrexial than the large bowel diarrhea, and the large bowel diarrhea, they might actually be so when you examine it. So how do you use this information? And again, you're going to get your advanced HIV guidelines and you're going to look it up because you run, they literally run for all the different organisms and what which gives small and large bowel diarrhea and what frequently will use. So these are our off protozoa as a common problem, the most common being cryptosporidium and cystospora. Um, and they often use watery, watery diarrheas. Um, and for your mycobacteria, so if you've got TB of the gut, or you've got MAC causing diarrhea, we often see MAC-associated diarrhea, those are also going to be small bowel, bowel diarrheas. But if we look at our bacterial, so this is classically our dysentery sort of organisms like Salmonella and Shigella, those that tend to be more large bowel that gets affected. Um, and quite often those you can pick up quite nicely also on, on soil cultures. Um, and then for our viral one, CMV, interestingly, CMV colitis is going to be more of a large bowel um, picture. Um, but HIV enteropathy, which can also cause diarrhea, will be more small bowel. So it's quite a maze to, to work through. And so we're going to look at a little bit of an approach. And then, of course, don't forget your medications like lupinavir, ritonavir, malabsorption syndromes, all your malignancies, just to keep it interesting. So if somebody's got profuse watery eye diarrhea um, and the CD4 is under 200, it's usually either cryptosporidium or isosporiosis. And the problem is because they are pouring and pouring, uh, it's not so easy to necessarily find on your culture. Once your CD4 starts dropping under 50, now, now it's open season. They can have herpes of the gut, they can have CMV of the gut, they can have posy of the gut, all kinds of things are possible. So firstly, when you're going to do that MCNS, you're going to need lots of samples. 
to make sure you actually get a result. Um, and certainly art is going to probably make the biggest difference. So some of these things you can't manage at all unless you've also finished your ARV. <coughs> so any patient with diarrhea more than two weeks, you want to do a stool MCNS. You want to specifically ask for cocodian parasites. We just normally write stool MCNS plus over plus parasites. And then they will look at the full panel for you. And you, I normally give them three bottles with three forms for three different days. So in the morning, you have just please send um, drop off for us. We don't generally do abdominal ultrasound for diarrhea, unless you think there's a similar TB or something. So it's not a particularly helpful investigation. So say all your MCNS has come back negative, or you're not winning, actually we need to scope. And we don't scope nearly quickly enough in these patients. So quite often you'll see them coming from the clinics and the clinics have been getting them bits of Bactrim and the Peramide, and, and they've sort of been um, ticking over for long periods of time. Um, and in endoscopy with a biopsy has got an additional diagnosis in 30 to 70 percent of cases. Just remember your herpes and <coughs> CMBs you're only going to find through biopsy. So this is interesting, and I was not aware of this. If I've got a large bowel symptoms like your dysenteries, then your classic flexible sigmoidoscopy is the way to go. But if they've got those small bowel diarrhea where they're pouring fluid, it's actually better to start with a gastroscopy and do duodenal aspirates involved. You have a slightly different approach depending on what you're looking for. So continuing with Mr. J, we do the source and MCNS, very satisfying when it comes back with something. You like you can do something and it's very easy to treat. Most of them respond very well. You miraculously sort out the diarrhea they've had for months and there are occasional resistant diarrheas and they cover that very nicely in the guidelines. And then just in general for our very the hectic ill patients is we all send them to the dietitians with the BMI of under 18.5. They need some extra nutritional supplementation or if they've been losing lots of weight. But the easy thing we recommend when we don't have supplements is mass. So most patients like mass. It's amazing. It's got an amazing amount of fat, carbs, and protein. Um, one glass gives you already an extra 158 calories. So if you have a glass with every meal extra, that already gives an extra 500 calories a day we aim for with supplements. So that's just a little tip. And then just a last little slide on cardiovascular system or other systems. So um, in our areas, we do see patients quite a lot of TB pericarditis. The patient comes in with the classic heart symptoms. Um, X-ray has got that classic lovely globular heart. ECG might even show something up. Um, and it's nice to get a cardiac echo, but if they don't have constricted, if they're not short of breath and you're out in the district, they've got TB symptoms and they've got a pericarditis, you can assume it's TB pericarditis and they actually respond very well to TB treatment. You might just want to chat to the infectious disease guys over the phone to discuss steroids or not, which is always controversial. And of course, if the patient's short of breath, just examine the calves and make sure there's not a DDT, they're all high risk of DDT as well. And then last year, always look in the mouth, which we do now again, because they're not wearing masks any longer. We were very bad at looking in the mouths during COVID. Um, and coral candidiasis, mostly we have some called coral candidiasis, which is easy to manage. But also, if you don't see Kaposi on the skin, you can sometimes just see Kaposi on the palate, which shows that they've got gastrointestinal Kaposi. And obviously check your, your legs as well. So you're going to refer these patients if you don't have a diagnosis. So if you're struggling to figure out what's going on, please send them to somebody else who might be able to do fancy stuff like bone marrow biopsies or CTs or scopes or lymph node biopsies. Don't wait too long. And if you think you know the diagnosis, but your patient's not responding to treatment, rather refer to somebody who can do the next investigations. So in summary, in terms of our approach, you start off always looking for TB and other respiratory OIs. Then you go and look for extra pulmonary TB, Make sure they're not septic. Make sure they're not in renal failure. Check the neurological <coughs> system. Check for abdominal signs. Check your skin, mucous membranes, and STIs. And hopefully, through that net, you'll be able to find most of the things that needs to be addressed. Thank you very much.